Tonight, we'll take you inside the growing, shadowy global market of cyber espionage. We look specifically at a controversial Israeli company called the NSO Group, valued at nearly a billion dollars, that says it developed a hacking tool that can break into just about any smartphone on Earth. NSO licenses this software called Pegasus to intelligence and law enforcement agencies worldwide so they can infiltrate the encrypted phones and apps of criminals and terrorists. Problem is, this same tool can also be deployed by a government to crush dissent. And so it is that Pegasus has been linked to human rights abuses, unethical surveillance, and even to the notoriously brutal murder of the Saudi Arabian critic Jamal Khashoggi. Headquartered in the Israeli city of Herzliya, NSO Group operates in strict secrecy. And I said to them. But co-founder and CEO Shalev Julio has been forced out of the shadows and not into a good light, accused of selling Pegasus to Saudi Arabia despite its abysmal record on human rights. And the word is that you sold Pegasus to them and then they turned it around to get Khashoggi. Khashoggi murder is horrible, really horrible. And uh, therefore, when uh, I first heard there are accusations that our technology being used on Jamal Khashoggi or on his relatives, I started an immediate check about it. And I can tell you very clear, we had nothing to do with this horrible murder. It's been reported that you yourself went to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. You yourself sold Pegasus to the Saudis for $55 million. Don't believe newspapers. Is that a denial? No. Pegasus is so expensive because it lets authorities do what they long couldn't, break into smartphones remotely, making everything in them completely visible. All emails, contacts, and texts, new, old, encrypted or not. Pegasus allows detectives and agents to track locations, listen in to and record conversations, basically turning the phone against its user. In the company's eight-year history, they have never let cameras in, but they wanted to show us they're like any high-tech company, with PlayStations and Pilates. But there was a lot we couldn't show. Notice no faces. The work is top secret, and some employees are ex-military intelligence and Mossad. Pegasus is such a sensitive spy tool, NSO has to get approval before it can be licensed to any client, let alone Saudi Arabia, from the Israeli Defense Ministry, as though it's an arms deal. Why would the government of Israel want, you know, what seems to be an enemy um, to have this technology. I'm, I'm not going to talk about specific customer. But uh, can, can you say that you won't and haven't sold Pegasus to a country that is known to violate human rights and imprison journalists and go after activists? I only say that we are selling Pegasus in order to prevent crime and terror. Stop. Penetrating an iPhone was an issue in the terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California in 2015. Right now we have one down outside the car. The FBI said it couldn't get into the shooter's phone, and Apple refused to help over privacy concerns, an issue that had come up before. Intelligence agencies came to us and say, we do have a problem with the new smartphones. Uh, we cannot longer get valuable intelligence. They were encrypted. Exactly. How many lives do you think Pegasus has saved? Ten of thousands of people. Really? Yes. Julio referred us to the head of a Western European intelligence agency who, off camera, confirmed that Pegasus is a game changer in foiling attacks by European jihadists, as well as shutting down drug and human trafficking rings. But here's the question. How often has Pegasus also been used to go after a government's critics? If you were in Saudi Arabia, you'd be in jail. 
Well, I don't think I will be in jail. I don't think anyone will find my body like what, what Jamal Khashoggi has faced. Ghanem al Masarir is a Saudi comic living in London who has a popular YouTube satire show that takes aim at Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Last year, as the regime was kidnapping, locking up, and torturing Saudi dissidents, Ghanem says he and other critics abroad got text messages like this fake DHL notice that, if clicked, would download Pegasus onto their phones so they could be spied on. And you clicked on it? Of course. Well, yeah, who's sending me a package? Now, Pegasus is designed to catch terrorists. So who defines the terrorist? Do you think I am a terrorist? Or do I look like a terrorist? I don't know what I don't yet. know what a terrorist looks uh, like. Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, the problem is the Saudis consider people asking for uh, freedom of speech as terrorists. They consider anybody who is a threat to their regime is a terrorist. What do you do when your customer has a definition of terrorist that isn't our definition? In some countries, the opposition are, are terrorists. No such thing. Every customer that we sold has a very clear definition of what terrorism is. And it's basically bad guys doing bad things in order to kill innocent people, in order to change the political agenda. I never met with a customer that told me that oppositions are terrorists. Well, they're not going to tell you. <laughs> but if they will act like that, yeah. they will not going to be a customer. There are more than 100 countries hundred countries that we will never sell our technologies to. The problem is there's, there are not proper controls around how this technology is being used. Based out of the Ron Debert heads Citizen Lab, a human rights watchdog at the University of Toronto, where researchers like computer scientist Bill Marzak say they figured out a way to detect if a phone has been targeted by Pegasus, which they did in the case of Ghanem al Masarir and other Saudi dissidents. This technology is being used by autocratic dictators who can mount global cyber espionage operations simply by purchasing the technology. So you are saying that once they sell this technology, once the Israelis sell it, mm -hmm. they know how it's being used? Well, uh, the question is, do they care to look? Um, I think if they cared to look, they would have the opportunity to see how it was being used. But Shalev Julio says NSO is unable to see who their clients are targeting. Only after there's an allegation of misuse can NSO demand target data in order to investigate. And I can tell you that in the last eight years that the company exists, we only had real three cases of misuse. Three cases. Out of thousands of cases of saving lives, Three was a misuse, and those people or those organizations that misuse the system, they are no longer a customer, and they will never be a customer again. The first case we uncovered in Mexico... But Citizen Lab says it was able to find many more cases, 25 in Mexico alone, where Pegasus was used to target political rivals, reporters, and civil rights lawyers. They also say they found the Pegasus link on the phone of this human rights activist, Ahmed Mansour, from the United Arab Emirates. I think that people that are not part of criminal or terrorist activities have nothing to worry about. Tami Shahar, NSO's co-president, says Pegasus is used with surgical precision. It's not mass surveillance technology. This is really for the bin Ladens of the world. But the reason that your company has been criticized, and the reason that we're here doing this interview is because countries have used your technology on human rights activists, on journalists. There are allegations that are being brought, there are reports that were said, and we take every such allegation very seriously, and we look into it. Nothing has been proven. To protect against misuse, she says, NSO has three layers of vetting potential customers. One by the Israeli Defense Ministry, a second by its own Business Ethics Committee, and thirdly... Our contractual agreements 
have our customers sign that the only intended use of the system will be against terror and oh, crime. Oh, they sign. Come on. You have an autocratic government and they say, oh, we're not going to use it except against criminals. And you just believe them? No. Come As on. I said, the Come contractual on. agreement comes yeah. after two layers. And you know, I would love for you to sit in one of our business ethics committee. We have a tough discussion. Because imagine a country is facing major terrorist threats. In the same time, they have some corruption issues. And you have to sit in that room and weigh what is more important, to help them fight terror, or maybe there is a chance that it's going to be misused. It's not a black and white answer. It's a tough ethic, ethical question. There are other ethical questions in deploying Pegasus. To hone in on a target, for instance, authorities often infect the phones of innocent people around them, like family members. It's been reported that Mexican authorities used Pegasus to capture drug lord Joaquin Guzman, better known as El Chapo, by tapping the phones of a few people he talked to while he was on the lam. I read it in the newspaper, the same as you. Okay. Uh, in order to catch El Chapo, for example, they had to intercept a journalist, an actress, and a lawyer. Now, by themselves, they, you know, they, they, they're not criminals, right? Right. But if they are in touch with a drug lord, and in order to catch them, you need to intercept them, that's a decision that intelligence agencies should get. What if you can prevent the 9-11 terror attack? And for that, you had to intercept the son, the 16 years old son of bin Laden. Would that be legit or not? Targeting someone's inner circle has become an issue in the Khashoggi case. Omar Abdelaziz, an influential Saudi online critic based in Canada, was texting with Khashoggi up to his death. Now Abdelaziz is suing NSO, alleging that the Saudis used Pegasus to hack his phone and thereby spy on Khashoggi. We asked Shalev Julio if his investigation explored the wider circumference around the slain journalist. I can tell you that we've checked, and we have a lot of ways to check. And I can guarantee to you, our technology was not used on Jamal Khashoggi or his relatives. Or the dissidents? Or like the Omar relatives. Omar Abdulaziz and... I'm not going to get into specific and tell you that if we will figure out that somebody has misused the system, we will shut down the system immediately. We have the right to do it, and we have the technology to do it. It begs the question, did you shut down the Saudis? I'm not going to talk about uh, customers, and I'm not going to go into specific. We do what we need to do. We help create a safer world. If most people remember anything about the North Korean government's cyber attack against Sony Pictures last November, it's probably that there was a lot of juicy gossip in leaked emails about movie stars, agents, and studio executives. There was also an absurd quality to the whole episode, which was over an ill-advised movie comedy about the assassination of North Korea's leader, which the North Koreans did not find funny. The weirdness of it all has obscured a much more significant point, that an impoverished foreign country had launched a devastating attack against a major company on U.S. soil, and that not much can be done about it. In some ways, it's another milestone in the cyber wars, which are just beginning to heat up, not cool down. The cyber attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment exposed a new reality that you don't have to be a superpower to inflict damage on U.S. corporations, a fact that has been duly noted within corporate boardrooms and the national security apparatus. What's the significance of the Sony hack in a nutshell? The significance is that a foreign power has reached out and touched an American target. The fact that the North Korean government felt that it could do something in the United States and get away with it, that's what's significant. James Lewis, a director at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, has helped shape U.S. cyber policy for decades, dealing with criminals stealing money, Russians stealing intelligence, and the Chinese stealing the latest technology. 
this was different because it qualified as the use of force. It qualified as an attack. There was disruption. There was destruction of data. There was an intent to hurt the company. And it succeeded, bringing a major U.S. entertainment company to its knees. Like other corporate victims of cyber attacks, Sony has released very little information and declined our request for interviews. We were allowed to film on Sony's 44-acre studio lot and inside this building where technicians were still repairing damaged computers. We do know that when people fired up their computers on the morning of November 24th, they were greeted with this skeletal image now referred to as the screen of death. It announced an undetected cyber attack that actually began weeks earlier when a malicious piece of software began stealing vast amounts of data from the Sony computer network. Now, it had begun the job of wiping Sony's corporate files. It was the attacker saying, I'm gonna delete what you've made. I'm gonna destroy your stuff. Kevin Mandia is one of the best known cyber sleuths in the US and his company, FireEye, was hired by Sony to respond immediately to the crisis. But there was only so much they could do. For lack of a better analogy, the wiping's the grand finale. That's the infamous, we ran into the house, we took what we wanted, and then we left the detonation charge behind us. And then that detonation charge goes off, you're not going back to the house anymore. And that's what happened? That's what happened. More than 3,000 computers and 800 servers were destroyed by the attackers after they had made off with mountains of business secrets, several unreleased movies, unfinished scripts, and the personal records of 6,000 employees, all of whom were given a taste of living offline. Sony made the decision to take itself off the grid. All connections to the internet, all connections to the rest of Sony, and all connections to third parties were shut off effectively disconnecting an international corporation from the outside world and plunging itself into a pre-digital age of landline telephones and hand-delivered messages written with pen and paper. Immediately, employees start to remember the things they took for granted. Does the gate let you in the garage? You can't get your email. People's benefits can't be processed appropriately. Time cards can't be done. What if payroll's the next day? There are so many things that depend on the internet that quite frankly, most companies don't even know all of them until they come off the internet and go, oh wow, didn't see that coming. To Kevin Mandia, it looked like a military style operation mounted by a foreign government. And when his company began comparing the Sony computer virus with the 500 million pieces of malware in its archives, it quickly came up with a nearly identical match, right down to the skull on the calling card. It was a cyber attack two years ago against South Korea's banks and broadcast networks called Dark Soul that wiped out 40,000 computers and caused $700 million in damage. We had the malware from the attacks that happened in South Korea in 2013, and these things, when put side by side, this looks like whoever hacked South Korea in 2013 is hacking Sony. And the attribution in those attacks in 2013 was to North Korea. Mandia's suspicions about North Korea, which has a well-established cyber capability and a long history of attacking its neighbor, were soon confirmed by the NSA, the FBI, and the White House. And the attackers themselves hinted at it when they contacted Matt Zeitlin of BuzzFeed.com and at least a half a dozen other online reporters, offering them everything they'd stolen from Sony. So this is the first email you got? Yep. Yeah, you know, the weekend after Thanksgiving, you know, it says that it has all this data from Sony and mm -hmm. would have all these links so that we could download the information. What followed from Zeitlin and others was two weeks of damaging, embarrassing stories from the corporate files and private emails of Sony executives, as well as threats and a specific demand from the attackers that Sony not release its comedy about the assassination of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. <laughs> because they ain't us. <laughs> Soon all the world will see what an awful movie Sony Pictures Entertainment has made. That part may have been true. <laughs> Sony scares CEOs. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the difference. Every CEO is walking around going, how do I feel if my email's out on the internet? How would I feel if my machines got disrupted? So all of a sudden, every chief information security officer is now talking to their board because every board wants to know, hey, is this the new normal? And it may well be. Kevin Mandia says even big corporations with sophisticated IT departments are no match for the dozens of countries that now have offensive cyber war capabilities. All advantage goes to the offense in cyber. It just does. On the defensive side, 
you have to say, I must defend all 100,000 machines, all 50,000 employees. The offensive side thinks, I only need to break into one, and I'm on the inside. And any company or any corporation is as strong as its weakest link? In a way, yes, in security. The nation-state threat actors or hackers target human weakness, not system weakness. And there's no shortage of weaknesses. Most company employees are allowed to browse online or visit Facebook on corporate computers, and many take them home for personal use. All it takes to contaminate a network is for one person to unwittingly access an infected file that looks realistic, like an Adobe Flash Player update or an email that pretends to be from Apple support. And then what happens when they click on them? They compromise their machine. And now that machine, being on the inside of a corporate network, can be used as a beachhead to increase access. And that's what happened at Sony. Eventually, the North Koreans were able to obtain the passwords and credentials of the company's computer system administrators and build them right into the malware that carried out the attack. With help from anybody? You know, anything's possible. I simply don't know. How sophisticated was the malware that they used? Was this brand new stuff? It was sophisticated enough that it works on the vast majority of companies. You know, the FBI is quoted as saying this would work at over 90% of the companies that they, they deal with. We're going to see more and more companies hacked. We're going to see deeper levels of destruction. So you're saying we're at the beginning? Yeah, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. If you want to talk about state-of-the-art hacking or what's going on in the international cyber arms market, John Miller is a good place to start. He turned down a job with the NSA and a government car while he was still in high school because he says he was already making more money doing private consulting work and honing his skills as a penetration tester. So you're a hacker? I was. Um, now I'm a, you know, a computer security professional. But yeah, I mean, for the majority of my career, I was an ethical hacker where I would actually go out and hack companies and then work with them to make sure they didn't get hacked by right. somebody else. Since Miller says he's been well paid to hack into nuclear power plants by utility companies, we wanted to know what he thought about the Sony attack and the malware the North Koreans used to pull it off. If I sat you down and gave you a pencil and paper and said, write a list of a dozen people that could do this. Oh yeah, I mean, there are way more than a dozen people. There are probably three, four, five thousand people that could do that attack today. And not all of them are in friendly countries. No, not all of them are in friendly countries. And the number is growing rapidly. I mean, it's certainly within the realm of possibility that a terrorist group could go out and put together a team and do some real damage. I mean, ISIS hacked CENTCOM's Twitter. The barrier to entry is low. Miller's previous job was leading a research team for a company that made and sold offensive cyber weapons to the U.S. government. He's currently a vice president of Silence, a company that makes next generation antivirus software for banks and Fortune 500 companies. It's currently marketing a product it claims would have detected and stopped the Sony hack while it was in progress. How sophisticated was this attack? Not very. When you look at it in contrast to the capabilities that the United States government are deploying, it is nowhere close to being sophisticated. My favorite analogy is the malware that was used to hack Sony is like a moped and the malware being deployed by United States intelligence agencies is like an F-22 fighter jet. It's much more sophisticated. It's much harder to detect. And yet still, if this is a moped, there were only a handful of companies in the United States that would have been able to survive this attack. And that really is the scary part, is it does not take an overly sophisticated attack to compromise these huge global multinational brands. Miller says there have been other major cyber attacks like the one against Sony, but they didn't get as much attention. In 2012, Iran was blamed for an attack against the headquarters of Saudi Arabia's national oil company, Aramco, that destroyed 30,000 computers. Iran has also been accused of a cyber assault against a group of casinos owned by Sheldon Adelson, a vocal enemy of the regime in Tehran. And there have been others. I've worked with companies before in the oil and gas space that have had control system networks get compromised by malware and, and they've lost control of their floating oil platforms. I remember reading about that. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, you didn't read about it. There was no need to disclose. No customer information got leaked. So these things happen more often than the public knows. Absolutely. There's a lot the public doesn't know about, including an active international underground market in cyber weapons, like the one that was used to take down Sony's computers. Miller took us to a site on the dark web where you can buy them. This is actually a list of black market exploits that I was contacted from a, a Russian hacker that he was trying to sell and his price, right? So what does this one do? Flash so player. this is a, a vulnerability in that software that would allow someone to take over control of your computer. 39,000, 29,000, 39,000. Yeah, majority of them are 30. That's $30,000 payable in Bitcoin, the virtual currency of choice on the dark web. For the most part, the internet is completely unregulated. It's the Wild West. It truly, truly is the Wild West right now. What we're seeing are people getting pulled out onto the street and shot. And it's like, where's the sheriff? There's no sheriff. When I started doing this stuff about 20 years ago, there were things that were top secret. You know, only NSA and FBI knew about them. You weren't allowed to even talk about them in public. You can download them now for free. James Lewis of the Center for Strategic and International Studies knows better than most that there are no easy solutions. He says the U.S. can deter catastrophic cyber attacks from China and Russia by responding in kind. But how do you respond to a rogue state like North Korea for an attack against major corporations like Sony? Turning off the lights in North Korea, no one would notice. It happens all the time, right? Uh, going after a North Korean movie studio, it would probably be a relief for the people there. The only pressure point we really have is going after the leadership going after the revenue streams coming to the leadership. And that's what the Obama administration has done, at least publicly. Lewis and others believe that it will take a technological breakthrough in cyber warfare defense to solve a problem technology created. But that could take years. Legislation forcing companies to improve cybersecurity has gone nowhere. There's a reluctance uh, in the Congress to force companies to do anything. The administration shares that reluctance. We were lucky until this year. Hopefully we'll be a little luckier for a bit longer. In the time being, keep your fingers crossed. I used to say that the U.S. had a, a faith-based defense when it came to cybersecurity because we had faith that the people who didn't like us weren't going to do anything bad. That's what Sony has changed, is that we had somebody who doesn't like us step out and say, how far can I go with the Americans? And that's where um, faith isn't enough. For the past few months now, the nation's top military, intelligence, and law enforcement officials have been warning Congress and the country about a coming cyber attack against critical infrastructure in the United States that could affect everything from the heat in your home to the money in your bank account. The warnings have been raised before, but never with such urgency, because this new era of warfare has already begun. The first attack, using a computer virus called Stuxnet, was launched several years ago against an Iranian nuclear facility, almost certainly with some U.S. involvement. But the implications and the possible consequences are only now coming to light. I do believe that uh, the cyber threat will equal or surpass the threat from counterterrorism in the foreseeable future. There's a strong likelihood that the next Pearl Harbor that we confront could very well be a cyber attack. We will suffer a catastrophic cyber attack. The clock is ticking. And there's reason for concern. For more than a decade, the U.S. military establishment has treated cyberspace as a domain of conflict where it would need the capability to fend off attack or launch its own. That time is here because someone sabotaged a top secret nuclear installation in Iran with nothing more than a long string of computer code. We have entered into a new phase of conflict in which we use a cyber weapon to create physical destruction. And in this case, physical destruction in someone else's critical infrastructure. Few people know more about the dark military art of cyber war than retired General Michael Hayden. He's a former head of the National Security Agency and was CIA director under George W. Bush. He knows a lot more about the attack on Iran than he can say here. This was a good idea, all right? But I also admit this was a really big idea, too. The rest of the world is looking at this and, say, and saying, clearly someone has legitimated 
this kind of activity as acceptable international conduct. The whole world is watching. The story of what we know about the Stuxnet virus begins in June of 2010, when it was first detected and isolated by a tiny company in Belarus after one of its clients in Iran complained about a software glitch. Within a month, a copy of the computer bug was being analyzed within a tight-knit community of computer security experts, and it immediately grabbed the attention of Liam Omerku, an operations manager for Symantec, one of the largest antivirus companies in the world. As soon as we saw it, we knew it was something completely different, and red flags started to go up straight away. To begin with, Stuxnet was incredibly complicated and sophisticated, beyond the cutting edge. It had been out in the wild for a year without drawing anyone's attention, and seemed to spread by way of USB thumb drives, not over the Internet. Omerku's job was to try and unlock its secrets and assess the threat for Symantec's clients by figuring out what the malicious software was engineered to do and who was behind it. How long was the Stuxnet code? You're talking tens of thousands of lines of code, a very, very long project, very well written, very professionally written, and very difficult to analyze. Unlike the millions of worms and viruses that turn up on the Internet every year, this one was not trying to steal passwords, identities, or money. Stuxnet appeared to be crawling around the world computer by computer looking for some sort of industrial operation that was using a specific piece of equipment, a Siemens S7300 programmable logic controller. This gray box here is essentially what runs uh, factory floors. And you program this box to control your equipment. Then you say, turn on a conveyor belt, uh, turn on a heater, turn on a cooler, shut the plant down. Um, it's all contained in that, in that box. And that's what Stuxnet was looking for. It wanted to get its malicious code onto that box. The Programmable Logic Controller, or PLC, is one of the most critical pieces of technology you've never heard of. They contain circuitry and software essential for modern life and control the machines that run traffic lights, assembly lines, oil and gas pipelines, not to mention water treatment facilities, electric companies, and nuclear power plants. And that was very worrying to us because we thought it could have been a water treatment facility here in the U.S. or it could have been trying to take down electricity plants here in the U.S. The first breakthrough came when Omerku and his five-man team discovered that Stuxnet was programmed to collect information every time it infected a computer and to send it on to two websites in Denmark and Malaysia. Both had been registered with a stolen credit card and the operators were nowhere to be found, but Omerku was able to monitor the communications. Well, the first thing we did was we looked at where the infections were occurring in the world and we mapped them out. And that's what we see here we saw that 70% of the infections occurred in Iran. That's very unusual for malware that we see. We don't normally see high infections in Iran. Please learn from Stuxnet. Two months later, Ralph Langner, a German expert on industrial control systems, added another piece of important information. Stuxnet didn't attack every computer it infected. This whole virus is designed only to hit one specific target in the world. How could you tell that? It goes through a sequence of checks to actually determine if this is the right target. It's kind of a fingerprinting process, a process of probing if this is the target I'm looking for, and if not, it just leaves the controller alone. Stuxnet wasn't just looking for a Siemens controller that ran a factory floor. It was looking for a specific factory floor with a specific type and configuration of equipment, including Iranian components that weren't used anywhere else in the world and variable speed motors that might be used to regulate spinning centrifuges, a fragile piece of equipment essential to the enrichment of uranium and longer speculated publicly that Stuxnet was out to sabotage Iran's nuclear program. Well, we knew at this time that the highest number of infections had been reported in Iran. And second, it was pretty, pretty clear just by looking at the sophistication that there would be at least one nation state behind this. And now you just add one and one together. By the fall of 2010, the consensus was that Iran's top-secret uranium enrichment plant in Natanz was the target, and that Stuxnet was a carefully constructed weapon designed to be carried into the plant on a corrupted laptop or thumb drive, then infect the system, 
disguise its presence, move through the network changing computer code, and subtly alter the speed of the centrifuges without the Iranians ever noticing. Sabotage by software. Stuxnet's entire purpose is to control centrifuges, to make centrifuges speed up past what they're meant to spin at and to damage them. Certainly it would damage the uranium enrichment facility and they would need to be replaced. If the centrifuges were spinning too fast, wouldn't the operators at the plant know that? Stuxnet was able to prevent the operators from seeing that on their screen. The operators would look at the screen to see what's happening with centrifuges and they wouldn't see that anything bad was happening. It now seems likely that by the time Omerku and Langner finally unraveled the mystery in November of 2010, Stuxnet had already accomplished at least part of its mission. Months before the virus was first detected, inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency had begun to notice that Iran was having serious problems with its centrifuges at Natanz. What we know is that an IAEA report said that 1,000 to 2,000 centrifuges were removed from the tanks for unknown reasons. And we know that Stuxnet targets 1,000 centrifuges. So from that, people are drawing to conclusion, well, Stuxnet got in and succeeded. That's the only evidence that we have. The only information that's not classified. Yes. And there are lots of things about Stuxnet that are still top secret. Who was behind it? What we do know is that this was a very large operation. You're really looking at a government agency from some, from some country um, who's politically motivated and who has the insider information from a uranium enrichment facility that would facilitate building a threat like this. An intelligence agency, probably. Probably. We know from reverse engineering the attack code that the attackers have full, and I mean this literally, full technical knowledge of every damn detail of this plant. So you could say, in a way, they know the plant better than the Iranian operator. We wanted to know what retired General Michael Hayden had to say about all this since he was the CIA director at the time Stuxnet would have been developed. You left the CIA in 2009? 2009, right. Does this surprise you that this happened? You need to separate my experience at CIA with your question. Right. All right? You can't talk about the CIA no, and, stuff. And, it's, and I don't even want to suggest what may, may have been on the horizon or not on the horizon or anything like right. that. Right. If you look at the countries that have the capability of designing something like the Stuxnet, and you take a look at the countries that have, would have a motive for trying right. to destroy uh, an advance. <laughs> Where do those two sets intersect? <laughs> um, uh, you're pretty much left with the United States and Israel. Well, yes, but, but it, 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 there is no good with someone of my background even speculating on that question, so I won't. Iran's president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, shown here at Natanz in 2008, blamed the cyber attack on enemies of the state and downplayed the damage. Both the U.S. and Israel maintain that it set back the Iranian program by several years. What's impossible to know is how much damage the attackers might have inflicted if the virus had gone undetected and not been exposed by computer security companies trying to protect their customers. They planned to stay in that plant for many years and, and to, to do the whole attack in a completely covert manner, that any time centrifuges would break, the operators would think, this is again a, a technical problem that we have experienced, for example, uh, because of poor quality of, of the centrifuges that we are using. We had a good idea that this was uh, a blown operation, something that was never meant to be seen, it was never meant to come to the public's attention. You say blown, meaning? If you're running an operation like this to sabotage a uranium enrichment facility, you don't want the code uncovered, you want it kept secret. Um, you want it just to keep working, stay undercover, do its damage and disappear and hopefully nobody would ever see it. Do you think this was a blown operation? No, <laughs> not at all. I think it's an incredibly sophisticated operation. But General Hayden did acknowledge that there are all sorts of potential problems and possible consequences that come with this new form of warfare. When you use a physical weapon, it destroys itself, in addition to the target, if it's used properly. A uh, cyber weapon doesn't. So there are those out there who can take a look at this, study it, and maybe even attempt to turn, turn it to their own purposes such as launching a cyber attack against critical infrastructure here in the United States. 
Until last fall, Sean McGurk was in charge of protecting it as head of cyber defense at the Department of Homeland Security. He believes that Stuxnet has given countries like Russia and China, not to mention terrorist groups and gangs of cyber criminals for hire, a textbook on how to attack key U.S. installations. You can download the actual source code of Stuxnet now, and you can repurpose it and repackage it and then you know, point it back towards uh, wherever it came from. Sounds a little bit like Pandora's box. Yes. Whoever launched this attack. They opened up the box, they demonstrated the capability, they showed the ability and the desire to do so, and it's not something that can be put back. If somebody in the government had come to you and said, look, we're thinking about doing this, what do you think? What would you have told them? I would have strongly cautioned them against it because of the unintended consequences of releasing such a code. Meaning that other people could use it against you? Yes. Or use their own version of the code? Something similar. Son of Stuxnet, if you will. As a result, what was once abstract theory has now become a distinct possibility. If you can do this to a uranium enrichment plant, why couldn't you do it to a, a nuclear power reactor in the United States or an electric company? You could do that to those facilities. It's not easy. It's a difficult task, and that's why Stuxnet was so sophisticated. But it could be done. You don't need many billions. You just need a couple of millions. And this would buy you a decent cyber attack, for example, against the U.S. power grid. If you were a terrorist group or a failed nation state and you had a couple of million dollars, where would you go to find the people that knew how to do this? On the Internet. They're out there? Sure. Most of the nation's critical infrastructure is privately owned and extremely vulnerable to a highly sophisticated cyber weapon like Stuxnet. I can't think of another area in Homeland Security where the threat is greater and we've done less. After several failures, Congress is once again trying to pass the nation's first cybersecurity law. And once again, there is fierce debate over whether the federal government should be allowed to require the owners of critical infrastructure to improve the security of their computer networks. Whatever the outcome, no one can say the nation hasn't been warned. More Americans than ever rely on alarm systems, gates, or doorbell cameras to help protect their families. But statistically, you are now more likely to be the victim of theft online than a physical break-in at home. A new report from the FBI reveals that Americans lost more than $10 billion last year to online scams and digital fraud. People in their 30s, who are among the most connected online, filed the most complaints. But we were surprised to learn the group that loses the most money to scammers is seniors. Tonight, we will show you how cyber con artists are using artificial intelligence, widely available apps, and social engineering to target our parents and grandparents. It's like a death in the family almost. Well, she's worked so hard, you know? For my money, I sure have. Susan Monahan and her daughter Tamara are talking about how the 81-year-old was conned out of thousands of dollars in what law enforcement calls a grandparent scam. Tell me about the call that you got. There was a young adult on the line saying, Grandma, I've, I need your help. In a frantic voice, scared, saying, I was driving and suddenly there was a woman stopped in front of me. She's pregnant and I hit her and they're gonna take me to jail. And, and Grandma, please don't call my mom and dad because I don't want them to know. And I said, Brandon, it doesn't sound like you. He said, oh, I have a cold, Grandma. You think it's your grandson? I do. And he said, Grandma, a friend of mine has an attorney that we can, that we can use and that we can do something about me going to jail. And I said, yes, of course. Monahan said the scammer, pretending to be a helpful attorney, got on the line. Mm -hmm. It was June of 2020, during the pandemic, and he promised to keep her grandson out of jail if she could get $9,000 for bail to him quickly. What other instructions were you given? Um, I needed to make an envelope that was addressed to this certain judge that he was gonna um, coordinate this through. 
and uh, right on there, and they gave me the name, the address, and everything else for this envelope. Did it sound pretty legitimate? He, oh, absolutely. He had the legalese. Monahan is a tax preparer with an MBA. The scammer kept her on the phone as she rushed to the bank. What do you say? He said, when you go there, make sure you tell them that it's for home improvements, because they might question the fact that you're withdrawing $9,000. Minutes after Monahan got home with the cash, a courier showed up to take it. This is video from the doorbell camera. You can hear Monahan on the phone with a scammer as she hands off the money. He said to move your butt. Okay, they're on a deadline. She says as soon as the courier left and the adrenaline left her body, she was filled with a sick feeling she'd been scammed. It's just devastating. What did they do to your mom? Beyond the money, beyond taking $9,000 from her. Well, it's your livelihood. Sorry. It just gets you, like, in your gut. The Federal Trade Commission reports scams like these skyrocketed 70% during the pandemic when seniors, home alone, went online to shop or keep in touch with family. How much money were you scammed out of? 11300 14000 7600 Judy Attig and her husband, Ron, a retired iron worker, were victims of the same grandparent scam as Susan Monahan. That's the view from their doorbell camera, as the same courier took off with $7,600 of their savings. $7,600 hits hard. Well, that oh, yeah. was for our, you know, if we wanted to go on a trip or something. It was terrible. I was, I was a mess. Steve Savage, a retired scientist, was scammed when he opened a fake email from the Geek Squad. The email said that your bank account is being charged uh, $399 for another year. And I'm like, wait a minute, I don't remember it being anywhere close to that. The customer service number went to a scammer posing as a representative of the company. Savage was duped out of $14,000. Esther Maestre was scammed too. The retired nurse says an alarm sounded on her iPad with a message to call tech support. She did. He said that last night between 4 and 9 p.m., your bank account has been hacked. And your heart probably stopped. You know, I felt so nervous. But he said, I am going to transfer you to another guy who is a security at Chase Bank. That fake bank employee told her hackers might be able to access her bank account and instructed her to immediately withdraw money and deposit it into a new account for safekeeping. Maestra did and lost $11,000. And have you been able to recover any of your money? Nothing. Nothing. I'm the one that pulled the money out of the bank so I won't be reimbursed. If your house gets broken into, you call the police. If right. this happens... There's no one to call. Scott Perello is a deputy district attorney who runs San Diego's Elder Justice Task Force and connected us to the victims you just heard from. He says studies show only one in every 20 seniors who've been scammed report it. Often, they're embarrassed. Most people who have not experienced this think, well, these people must have dementia or Alzheimer's. It's not the case. Our victims are sharp as a tack. We had a woman 66 years old she came home. She got a message on her computer from Microsoft, and the message said that she had a virus on her computer, and then that virus had somehow infected her financial accounts. Mm -hmm. Within a matter of weeks, this victim had lost $800,000. Oh, my gosh. The scariest part of these scams is that these victims have no recourse. They're left bewildered. What typically happens? The seniors that have the courage to report that this has happened are being told that, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. And, and that is the reality, that a local uh, d police detective in Kansas City doesn't have the reach to go investigate a case that's being operated from the Caribbean or from Nigeria or Ghana. Investigators have also traced scams to Europe, Southeast Asia, and Canada. Under reporting. To combat them, San Diego's Elder Justice Task Force has taken a new approach. Investigators collect every local fraud case, then collaborate with federal authorities to connect them. If we have a victim that lost $12,000 here in San Diego, there is without question dozens of other victims to the same scam 
and millions of dollars in losses. And then once we identify that the scam is part of something much larger, then we can deliver that to our federal partners with the reach to go around the country because these are networks. These are transnational organized criminal networks. In 2021, Pirello helped the FBI bring down a network of criminals who stole millions of dollars from elderly victims. Remember those doorbell videos from the grandparent scam? The Courier, a 22-year-old Californian, was the starting point for the FBI's case. She's serving time for her role. But the FBI says the scam's ringleaders, two Bahamian nationals based in Florida, fled the country before they could be arrested. If you don't know how a criminal thinks, then you really don't know how you can protect yourself online. Rachel Toback is what's called an ethical hacker. She studies how these criminals operate. So ethical hackers, we step in and show you how it works. Toback is the CEO of Social Proof Security, a data protection firm that advises Fortune 500 companies, the military, and private citizens on their vulnerabilities. We hired her to show us how easy it is to use information found online to scam someone. We asked her to target our unsuspecting colleague, Elizabeth. Toback found Elizabeth's cell phone number on a business networking website. As we set up for an interview, Toback called Elizabeth, but used an AI-powered app to mimic my voice and ask for my passport number. Oh, yes, 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 I do have it. Okay, ready? It's... Toback played the AI-generated voice recording for us to reveal the scam. Elizabeth, sorry, need my passport number because the Ukraine trip is on. Can you read that out to me? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yes. Did you, and I gave her, wow. Well, I was I duped I was sitting over there. Did, what did it say on your phone? Sharon. How did you do that? So I used something called a spoofing tool to actually be able to call you as Sharon. Oh, so I was no. hacked and I failed. I failed hacking. No. But everybody would get tricked with that. Yeah. Everybody would. It says Sharon. Why would I not answer this call? Why would I not give that information? Toback showed us how she took clips of me from television and put it into an app that cloned my voice. It took about five minutes. I am a public person. My voice is out there. Could a person who's not a public person like me right. be spoofed as easily? Anybody can be spoofed. And oftentimes, attackers will go after people. They don't even know who these people are. But they just know this person has a relationship to this other person. And they can impersonate that person enough just by changing the pitch and the modulation of their voice that I believe that's my nephew and I need to really wire that money. Tobag says hackers no longer need to infiltrate computers through a back door. She says 95% of hacks today happen after a user clicks on a text, a link, or gives personal information over the phone. You were able to hack my colleague Elizabeth, who is a tech-savvy millennial. What does that tell you? Anybody can be hacked. Anybody can fall for what Elizabeth fell for. In fact, when I do that type of attack, every single time the person falls for it. She said hackers armed with basic information, like a relative's name found online, or an app that can mimic a voice or change the caller ID, can create a convincing story. If you were to receive a phone call, a text message, an email, and it's asking for something sensitive, urgent, or with fear, that's when the alarm bells have to go off in your head and they want me to give something to them. I'm gonna take a beat and I'm gonna check that this person is who they say they are. I call it being politely paranoid. Politely paranoid. Being politely paranoid. Toback has worked as a consultant for Aura, a Boston-based technology company that created software to protect the identity, passwords, finances, and personal data for entire families in one app. So here you can see a full footprint of everything that's happening inside the family. Um, so Hari Ravachandran is the CEO of Aura. He says their software can reroute scam calls away from grandparents. If the parent is getting a call and we are identifying using AI that the call is a potential scam call, then they can route that call to me. Does this stop the call from getting in? It does. It, so it so just blocks the call? When the call comes in, uh, it will uh, have a recording that says, let me know who you are, what's your intent. If it's an unknown person, if it's a known person that's already in your contacts, it'll go right through. Ravishandran says AI is also used to monitor finances and alert users of problems in real time. If I see a charge uh, from my mom for $10 at Starbucks, 
that feels okay, but if there's a $500 charge from Starbucks, something's off kilter. So we try to figure out uh, with AI contextually what's different. But if something is off pattern, you can look at that and say, okay, well, something's off here. I need to go take care of this. San Diego Deputy District Attorney Scott Perello says more help is needed from law enforcement and the banking and retail industries to protect seniors. The FBI reports over the past two years, the losses from digital theft have doubled. The trends and, and the data are horrifying. We have the senior population is growing exponentially every year. We have this dynamic of underreporting, and then we have the technology coming. People are convinced that AI is playing a part in maybe pretending it's the grandchild's voice. We're all just next on the conveyor belt, and we all need to do a better job.